I am Vinny Todorich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen. Don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. Just like my guest, we will be actually be talking about kids who are not so lean and not so mean anymore because they don't have anyone to be mean to, from what I can tell. Um, this is the Friday show. This is when we bring people in with way more information than I could ever have. Today, we have a, a guest. That was a suggestion from Dr. Drew. If you remember back from that show a few weeks ago, he started mumbling this woman's name in the middle of the show, saying you have to have her on. So what did I do? I um, I got on the hook and I got Lisa on uh, uh, how you say the uh, the text. And we had the text chain. You see, I'm trying to sound cool like the kids. Next thing I know, uh, she uh, is here with us today, folks. Dr. Lisa Stroman. She's written a couple of books, one called Unplugged, the other one called Digital Distress. She's done a couple of TED Talks. So uh, this woman's been around the block a bit. And uh, she's got she's got knowledge. I have questions. And uh, we're going to bring her right in. Lisa, how are you? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for fitting this in. I know you're super busy and um, we went back and forth. Can you do it this time? Can you do it that time? <laughs> so here we are finally. Um, you, you are working on something that is so near and dear to my heart right now <laughs> that I just, I freak out on a daily basis. I'm going to tell you my latest freak out. Now, when I say freak out, I'm not a Karen. I don't go around yelling at people. I freak out internally. And then I come home and just yell at my wife about it. That's the well, way. That's I, not healthy. Yeah. I, I, you see, I don't, but I don't want to yell at people in public, you know, people to pull out the cameras and whatever. I, and I come home and say, honey, you'll never believe what I saw. And this had bothered me in, in ways that you can't imagine because I've been thinking about this kid ever since. Um, I'm at the gym. Now, as you can tell, I have a gym in my office. There's a gym behind me. But if I don't leave this office and go somewhere in life, I'm just stuck here working or like a hermit. So I belong to a couple of gyms in town. Uh, go to the gym. And um, I it, it goes on set. In between every set, people pick up the phone and, they're, they're, you know, and I wish they were looking up like this. They're usually like this. They're slumped down and they're over the phone and they're, they're doing this thing, right? Well, the other day I'm watching this kid because I'm, an, I'm, I'm, I'm what you call an observer of people. And I'm watching. And this kid is looking at his phone and look. And I did three sets. Kid never did a set. Still looking at his phone. I moved to another another machine. I do two more sets. And slowly, the kid gets up. And he moves over to the the um, the cable row machine, right where you could do cable rows, but there was no there was no bar on it, he would have to put the a frame bar on the machine. It was just it was just a dangling, you know, clip. Oh. there. Yeah. Hook. Yeah. It's not even a hook. It's a carabiner. So, you know, it's got the little spring yeah. load in it. We're going to pretend, let me find something on my desk. We're going to pretend this pen is the carabiner. And of course, he's got to press in on the carabiner in order to hook the A frame bar in. So he grabs the A frame bar with one hand. The phone is still in the other hand, like this. And now he's trying, I have pretty big hands. So my fingers can almost do, this. he's trying to work the, the carabiner with this hand while he's holding the A-frame bar with his left hand. And I went, oh, I gotta see how long this goes on. <laughs> it goes on for like a minute, a, a real minute. Now, you know how long a minute is? In a long time. time. It's a long time. And I say, I, I got to watch. I, I, how long is he going to do this? He's not letting go of the A-frame bar. He's not letting go of the phone. He's just trying to work it around the phone. He then sits down on the, on the pad that you would sit on to do the exercise. 
he puts the phone on his thigh. So again, the phone is still touching him. Still touching, yeah. I, I want important. to make that point. And he clips it really fast. And after he clips it, he's holding the, it's now clipped in. He's holding the A-frame bar. He grabs the phone again and looks at it while he has the A-frame bar in his hand. And I looked at that and I went, wow. Wow, it's such, I'm calling it a pacifier, but it's more than a pacifier. He couldn't have this device. Now, the reason my device is here with me today is because I'm talking to you. And I wanted to demonstrate this. Normally, this is not with me. People get mad at me. As a matter of fact, we can get rid of it now. People get mad at me. I texted you know, my business. I texted you five times. I called three times. Why didn't you pick up? Andy, I don't have the phone with me. <laughs> you couldn't hear it? No, it's on vibrate in another room. It's not with me. And he goes, oh, and so my wife, Serena, same thing. Oh, you, oh, you're Mr. Cool. You don't have the phone with you. It's like, I'm not being cool. I don't want my life to be ruled by a two by four inch piece of glass. The only time the phone is in my hand is when I'm working, when I'm sending my, my tweets out and the whole thing, that kind of thing. I tweet, I do this, I do that, I send messages, and then it's gone again. Right. I don't right. want to become that person. So I'm not going to become I'm 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 baked. I'm 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 baked. I'm 60 years old. I'm I'm baked. But these kids are not baked. They're half baked. Right? right. They're still yeah. in the oven. What say you? What's going on? Talk to me about this kid and why he couldn't let go. What was going on? What did I miss? Well, A, I'm guessing he's probably in his 20s, something like that. Like around that age so he's he's grown up in this world where you you've been introduced to a device it's entirely different their process of everything that they've ever done in their world they don't actually have a sense of self without having a reflection of the outside world and and i say that very simply but but i think it's important for you the listeners to understand that this new generation that's growing up does not operate or doesn't have the opportunity given the social media and the reflection that they get on a constant basis that now requires that external motivation that external affirmation for them to be able to do anything is through that two by four piece of glass and the psychology is to me terrifying because you don't it's it's shifting our world in ways that are are super damaging. There's a lot of opportunity that can be amazing. But what you are describing is that you use tech as a tool and kids do not understand tech as a tool. And a lot of times it's because parents hand it to them as gifts, hand it to them on a special occasion or hand it to them and say, here's what you, you know, this is an our, this is something that you get to have on your own, which is never the way it should go. It should be, here's something that you can use to help you in your academics or use because it's a tool for you but we don't ever introduce it that way. We don't do training on it in any way. Um, I've been talking about this literally my whole career, almost 20 years now. Uh, and I was at the FBI when Columbine happened and I saw, I worked in the profiling unit and as a visiting scholar, and I uh, was just on a side seat to see how these profilers were looking at Cleveland and Harris. And at the time, Harris had dumped a bunch of stuff online and I got to see the beginning of the beginning of where I could see the psychology of technology going. And it has terrified me ever since. And we are asleep at the wheel as a society. And I make no apologies. And I stand up and I speak every chance I get. Yeah, you know, I, I like to talk a little more about the Klebold thing, you know, the, the Columbine thing, because that was the first time we saw anything of its kind. Um, I get mad, like I got mad the other day, I was going over to get some groceries. And again, I'm I'm old man Vinny, right? Mm -hmm. I'm driving slowly through the parking lot. And there's um, like an old Navy or something next to the grocery store. And I saw mom, mama duck, and three daughters behind her, baby ducklings, 
And they walk out of the thing and they walked across the street in front of, I'm guessing my car weighs somewhere about 5,000 pounds. There's a 5,000 pound projectile and all four, mommy and the three ducklings, staring at the phone and walked right in front of me. What if I was an older guy who, instead of seeing that and hitting the brakes, what if I was like a, a 78? I, there's a lot of old people in my community, 90, 85 year old. Yeah. He, oh my God, I need to hit the brake. They hit the gas. You can wipe out a family, right? right. But even look up there. They didn't even know I was there. There's a 5,000 pound projectile coming at you and you're not flinching. That That's a problem. But go I back. mean, absolutely. Yeah. They're, I mean, people, yeah. Oh, go back. Go back to what? To Klebold. And, and, and okay. what did you guys see there? So, Harris was really the, the disturb was really more of the, the individual that was disturbed and like was having trouble. And if you look at like the behavioral patterns and all of the, all of the things, um, that's a unique case because there was a second shooter. Um, and Klebold really was a depressed, lonely kid. Um, I actually had Sue Klebold, his a mom on my podcast, uh, she's an amazing human and has dedicated her life to stand up and talk about, you know, what her son had done. Um, and, and so when you, when you really look at like the, the psychology of where that is, it's that radicalization that occurred early on with a really disturbed individual without a lot of help. I mean, Harris, Eric Harris did not have a lot of help in that, in that um, capacity, the way we do today, the kids today that are now, kind of falling in line and following the footprints and these manifestos and things like that. Um, back when they were, were um, planning it, you know, MySpace wasn't even a thing. All of that got posted after the shooting actually happened. So all of the, the psychology of now when we have like these kind of copycat events that are occurring are basically going back to that original Columbine event and post it because they posted all of the things that he had done. And so now you've got all of these like, followers in the, in the same way that the people like follow, you know, the Kardashians, right? Like kids that are upset and are disturbed and don't have a home. And this is one of the reasons why I think that technology is such an issue. They will find a home with the misfits and they will find a home and show everybody what, what, why they're hurting and why, what's wrong. So we will never be able to untangle mental health and wellness from technology ever again. We're, we're too far in it, um, but we have to start paying attention and doing something different now. Yeah, I've I've uh, heard podcasts with Miss Klebold, or is it Mrs. Klebold? And yeah. Be because I remember at the time, what year was it? Remind me of the year. 99, Okay, so yeah, this is long before MySpace or any of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was trying to blame the parents, going, where are the parents? Why, why aren't the parents know that they're doing all this? And my bigger question was, where was the kid with any sense to go, hmm, are we doing the right thing? Because the part people may not remember about the Columbine thing is, is that they planted bombs around the school too, right? And they mm -hmm. were making bombs. And I, I get making bombs without your parents knowing it. I mean, we we did minuscule things compared to that. You know, we we were hiding Playboys, and you know, but you're you're able to get stuff by your parents, right? You're mm -hmm. able to get everything by your parents. I don't blame the parents there. I always wondered why there was three kids, right? It was Klebold, Harris, and a third kid. No, or just two kids, just okay. two. At some point. Could one of the kids, maybe Klebold, since he wasn't as disturbed as Harris, say, you know, hey, are we doing the right thing here? Should we be doing this? Or, you know, maybe this isn't cool. Or maybe reach out to a grown up going, look, this is going on and I can't stop it now. Can you help me? None of that happened. Right. I mean, they were that deep in it. Right. Right. And even and today, in that event, if you want to talk about that specific one, I know um, with Sue spoke to this, that there was there were not any signs that, you know, that Dylan Klebold was like a very sweet kid. I think his nickname, she said, was Sunshine. And 
Um, but he was, he was depressed and he didn't have a lot of friends. And Eric, Eric Harris was the one who like kind of befriended him and like made him feel welcome and made him feel um, important. And so I think, you know, particularly if you look at like what the profile of all of these active shooters are, is a lot of times they're estranged they're um, ostracized from groups. They they aren't they aren't accepted, um, and a lot of them are what we call incels, which are involuntary celibate men. And there's a lot of anger, and so there's like testosterone and hormones and psychopathy and all of that stuff all blended together that creates this avenue of where um, you know they they make a determination, and unfortunately, um, a lot of times it's at the school level because that's where they get a lot of their abuse and pain from. Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to name drop here, but uh, my friend Howie Mandel um, would always say to me after one of these mass shootings, um, he would go, you know, and by the way, I don't know if Howie's pro gun or against guns. I just don't know um, about that. But right. he would always say they're going to go after the guns and no one's going to mention mental health. You know, it, the news is going to just go AR-15, it, whether an AR-15 was used or not. Mm -hmm. Right. They're going to go AR-15, mm -hmm. AR-15, because they don't know. It's just a bunch of news people just spewing out the, the only term they learned in the past 30 years, right? And it doesn't matter if you're for or against guns. The problem is we have 300 million guns out there. If we stopped making guns today, the problem won't go away in a lifetime, not in America. Right. You know, no. So how about we talk about where the problem is? Go on. Well, this is not a gun problem. This is this is a mental health problem. This is a society where we have been slowly and consistently programmed to detach, right? You've got the, the need to have a, an authentic connection with one another. I can't tell you how many times I see teenagers and they don't even know how to make eye contact, right? I, I, I can look at the statistics, right? I'll share some of those. Like the average age in the United States, a child gets their first device is six. The average age a child get is views their first pornographic image is eight. And chronic viewing begins at 11. So you have these young prepubescent children being hypersexualized. And you're, you're expecting them to go out into the world and be normal or not be impacted by that. It is starting way younger than our society has even paying attention to. And it's so hard from my perspective. And this is where I went out and accosted Drew in an event and said, I need your help uh, because I, I really, truly believe that we are creating uh, an addictive potential, not just in technology, but in other substances and things later in life, because of we're starting it at such a young age that that addiction, that addictive uh, reward pathway is actually getting like highlighted early on. It's terrifying. You know, you mentioned porn, and I don't mean this to sound funny or any other way, but it was the first time I was mentoring a kid. Um, we're going to call him John. Um, I must have been 42, 43 years old. And his mom was a really good friend of mine. And um, so his his mom was single. They had a lot of money, big Beverly Hills family. And um, mom was dating. As a matter of fact, she was on a, a dating app. Right. And um, so when she was doing this, she was going out a lot. And um, I knew John was home alone. So I would call him up and go, John, because it was like John and whoever the, the maids were or whatever, you know, the housekeeper or whoever. Um, so I said, John, um, I'm, I'm going to grab dinner tonight. You want to come? And, uh, he was like, yeah. So we would go out to eat. Sometimes we'd go play basketball. You know, we'd just do different things. You know, I just did things with this kid and his mom had convinced me to get on to a dating site. This was long before I met my, my wife. And, uh, so I went on and the reason I went on was, you know, good looking guy in LA. I was getting dates all the time. I wasn't getting the right dates. And I was picking women based on looks, right? right. You're hot. I'm going to ask you out. And I find out that you're a struggling actress and you, you're looking for a guy to hang on to and the whole thing. It just would never work out. 
and her his mom convinced me you go on a dating site and you you, you can read profiles about these people or how naive I <laughs> so naive <laughs> and you can learn about these people and decide before you waste any time or effort on a date right so one night um I came back and I I was staying with John because his mom wasn't home yet and I went on to the computer and I was checking my thing I was into this right and he looked over my shoulder, he goes, Oh, you got one of those sites like my mom. I said, Yeah, your mom set it up for me. And he sees this woman and he goes, Hey, she looks hot. Now, this is a this is a 12 year old kid. Yeah. He goes, She's hot. I said, Yeah. He goes, Why don't you go over and bring her a pizza and fuck her? Wow. I said, I said what? He goes, Yeah. Go get a pizza and and bring it over to her house and fuck her. And I said, "Well, John, that, that's uh, that, that's not how dating works." And I didn't want to say to him, "You know, your mom's on a date right now." <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So I said, "Well, where did you get? Wh where are you coming from? Let, let's talk about this." And he goes, "Well, that's what you do, right? You you, you like show up at their house, and then you." And then you fuck them. And I was like, uh, well, no, no, it, you, you go on several dates with them. If, if you like them, they like you. And, you know, if you fall in love, you know, I'm trying to make it sound, you know, I'm not, I didn't want to do no, John, there's three days right. to the third date. You know, I wasn't, <laughs> I was just trying to be as, you know, oh, you, you just, you do this, you know? And um, he was like, no, that's not how it works. I said, well, who gave you this information? He goes, I, I learned that online. I said, where did you learn that? He goes, pornographics. Yeah. And apparently he would watch things where the pizza boy would go over and the lady would go, well, I don't have enough money, but if you come in here, I'll, you know, <laughs> you can. Right. Wait with right. You. In his mind, right. We're talking 2002, 2001, 2000. So in his mind, that, that was dating. All you needed was a pizza. Right. I can only imagine where it is now. I mean, it is, well, a post pandemic, you know, like if I look at, I work with a group called gaggle, they like look at just what kids do in schools in 2021 school year. I pulled up their stat. There was a, <laughs> there was a 281% increase in nudity and sexual content of elementary school kids. So what, like during the pandemic, what happened was that, you know, the schools had to obviously scramble, they handed out devices, and under school parameters using their Wi Fi, it would have been protected. And it would have screened out their ability to go into, I mean, like, it's not like a porn site, People, these kids aren't going to Pornhub, they're going on YouTube, you know, they're going on like, general sites, and they're, they're looking up things that this is what frustrates me so much. They're looking up things like, in second grade, I have to do a report for um, my class and I have to look up a historical figure and they Google Ponce de Leon or Sir Francis Drake or whatever. And once they pull that up, it is attached with ad bundles for porn. So it's not that the kids are out there seeking it. It is. Oh, wait, this is, how, how is that even a thing? So if I look up Ponce de Leon, how, how does porn? So if I Google right now Ponce de Leon, mm -hmm. how does porn come up? I, I, I've never seen that. So if you look, if you look as a kid, if you are doing a report and you start to look up a historical figure, Abraham Lincoln, whatever, whomever it is, and you look it up, those industries, the porn industry is going out and they are attaching ads to those historical figures because they know elementary school kids are going in there and looking it up. Wow. It, it, it happened to, to, um, uh, Elon Musk, his group, when he, when he put SpaceX up, I was sitting there watching their like a board meeting on SpaceX. I thought it was super cool to be involved in it, like to like be able to listen in on their like first conversation. And all of a sudden I started getting porn ads and I thought, oh shit, like I better call Musk's people and tell them that this is happening. They couldn't, they, they couldn't care less. They're like, you know, we pay again, they're paying SpaceX as a company is paying to get 2 million eyeballs on, on their, on their board meeting. That's, that's what they paid for. And what happens is that we know where those 2 million eyeballs can be pulled from. 
And it is, it is through the porn industry. And so they bundle, it's called ad bundling and they bundle the ads. And, and if you can get to an eight-year-old, you've got a kid 10 years before an 18 year old can, you know, legally technically like look at a porn site. Um, you've got 10 extra years as at having a consumer That's e- and it's easy picking. Like, parents I'm, aren't paying I'm, attention. I'm more naive about this than I thought, because I, look, I'm in health and fitness and have been for my entire life. And um, porn is not exactly what I'm looking up. I'm, I'm, right. I'm not a teetotaler. I'm, I'm not, you know, I have who hasn't. Right. Um, but I, that's not something I look up. The only <laughs> thing, the only place I live is on Instagram because I, I put a post up every day on Instagram and I will go and hit the, you know, the search on Instagram to see what comes up. And it's nothing but hot women, just uh, not porn, but just smoke show. Beautiful women. women. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. I look up motorcycles because I've been an enthusiast my entire life. I look up boats because I, I'm an enthusiast. I look up model airplanes. I'm an enthusiast. I look up uh, kayaks. I'm an enthusiast. I look up archery. I'm an enthusiast. I never look up hot chicks, but somehow yes. some algorithm, I might see one motorcycle. I might see one guy shooting archery. I might see a boat, every, but it's, it's just a plethora of hot chicks. Period. Yep. Yep. Period. And my buddy tells me the same thing. You know, my best friend. Same deal. Why? The question is why. They're not really giving us what we're looking up. They're giving us this anyway. They're giving you what makes them money. And they're giving you what they anticipate that that your demographic, their decision, like whatever that algorithm is, is going to feed into it. And I think you know, I mean, Instagram to me is, you know, it. it I, I looked at the CDC data and you can see exactly when Instagram came out in 2010 and you can see mental health tank, right? And I, you know, I TikTok came out in 2016 and like suicide rates like skyrocketed around, among kids. Like it, it's not healthy for us to get things like sent into our brains that we're not looking for. If you were looking at motorcycles or they're sending you stuff on the the algorithm that you actually are interested in and is expanding your knowledge base and all of those things. Fantastic. But if they're sending you things that are, is, is tapping into that primal drive, like food, water, and sex primal drive, right? Mm -hmm. They're tapping into that primal drive. It is not a fair game, right? They they're going to win and marriages are broken up over it. I mean, you know, I mean, in my clinical practice, it's, the the number of marriages and families that have broken apart over this algorithmic um, programmatic thing is, is ridiculous. But, you know, how do you, how do you say no, right? I'm at an all you can eat buffet and calories don't count. So to speak, right. That's what, that's what they look at. That's what we're talking about today. The calories here count because you count. We're we're losing it. Um, Right before we left LA, um, my wife uh, decided to do a play. And when you do a play, you, you're there all the time. You're practicing all the time. And then there's nights when you have to perform. And um, so that left me alone a lot of the time. Uh, I only cook about five different things. <laughs> so I made it a point like, you know, once or twice a week, went down the street, um, really happening you know, eatery, it's a, a gastro pub and it's, there's a big bar, but it's walking distance from, from where I was living. So I would walk on over. And uh, since I was eating alone, I would eat at the bar and I would do my social media that, you know, one of the times when I'm doing my social media, I'm doing my social media while I'm waiting for my food. Once the food comes, the phone goes away and now I'm not working, I'm eating. Well, one night I'm eating and I'm looking around and all of a sudden, I was there on a night that must have been a cool night to be there. It wasn't a weekend. TGI, Wednesday, I don't know what they do. But the bar is now filling up. Filling up with people much younger than me. And they're all happening. And they're all, you know, hip and young. And looking at this going, oh, look at this. I haven't seen this in 25 years. (laughs) But what I see is a bunch of hot women talking to each other 
and I see a bunch of hot dudes talking to each other, but they're not talking, the men are not talking to the women, the women are not talking to the men. I'm looking at this going, the chick over there, I would do, I, I give a month of paychecks just to say hi to her back in my day, right? And no okay. one's approaching her. And she's looking at her phone. And look at these guys over here. They're huddled up looking at their phone. And this was very confusing to me, right? Mm -hmm. So I talked about it on, on the podcast the next day. And um, everyone tweeted me and said, dude, they were communicating through their phone. They were swiping left and right. I still don't know what the swiping thing is. But you see, you talked about that eye contact. Or that mm -hmm. reflection, that piece of, or that that feeling of when you walk up to someone, you walk up to a woman, you don't know if she's going to say yes, no. You don't. She might say, "Get out of here, creep." You don't know, right? But they're mm -hmm. cutting out that human interaction, that that important first meeting. What say you? Is, is that what's really happening, or what, what's going on there? Well, they're absolutely cutting it out. We're not we're not training our children in the humanistic behaviors that we all need. We need connection and we need touch and we need um, be, to be accepted for whom we are. And what we have is a generation of kids that have grown up that, you know, should we put anything out there that isn't edited, filtered, you know, projecting like the my best life. Um, that we will get rejected or we will be judged or we will be, you know, considered um, less than. I think I gave a speech and I, it was in front of like 2,500 high school kids or something. And, and it was a big deal. You know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of high schoolers. Like I'm <laughs> like to be in front of all at once. And I had this group of kids line up afterwards to come talk to me. And there, a girl came up to me. She said, I just wanted to tell you how brave you are. And I thought, well, you know, like it is, this is a pretty big crowd of teenagers to be trusting yourself in front of. And she said, and I said, thank you. I said, you know, public speaking, it gets easier, but, you know, it's trying to like connect with her. And she's like, Oh no, no. She's like, I Googled you while you were talking. I, I you, none of your pictures are filtered. I just think you're so brave. And yeah. I thought, Holy shit, this girl's giving me a compliment because I don't know how to use a filter <laughs> put out there, you know, a better version of myself. Um, and it really like it, it's, you know, it, you know, it stuck me like, and I just like, I grabbed her by her shoulders and I was like, honey, like you, you don't have to filter yourself, like just be you. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like that permission, like they don't know, they don't know that they can just be them. Well, look, it, and it, it manifests in a different way because, you know, I'm in the weight loss game and, you know, people have lost hundreds of pounds following my advice and what we do here and everything else. And, I do these consults where people can call me and, and set up a, an hour long or a half an hour consult. And um, a lot of times it's women more than men where they'll say, you know, I've, I've lost the 60 pounds. I'm lighter than I was in high school, but I'm not ripped and I want to get ripped. How do I get ripped? And since they know I did that in Hollywood for all those years to, for celebrities, they'll go, pretend I'm getting ready to do a movie and I have to be ripped like Linda Hamilton ripped. What would you tell me? By the way, folks, I didn't work with Linda Hamilton. That's what wasn't one of my clients. And, um, you know, I'll say, well, what, what are you trying to do? You're at a perfect weight. Your, your, your A1Cs are great. Everything is great. They want to look like these models on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to explain to them the models on Instagram do not look like the models on Instagram. If you saw them without the filters, without the lighting, without the makeup, without all of it, they don't look like that. As a matter of fact, if you saw them walking down the street, you wouldn't recognize them as being that person. Trust me on this. I lived in Hollywood. I know who these people are. They don't look like that. But it's so hard to get these people to understand. Everybody wants this. And by the way, I don't know if you know this. These um, bodybuilders and fit models, Last year alone, 30-something IFBB pros just dropped dead in their 20s. Some of them were in their 30s. Some, most of them in their 20s. Because these people are doing dangerous things to look a certain way. They're looking inhuman. They're, you know, we're trying to build the perfect body, right? It doesn't work that right. way. Right. Right. We have right. The in yeah, that Instagram world of like, I, my, I eating disorders is like a huge area of like, 
you know, orthorexia, like the exercise induced and all of that, but your world, right? You put that, those images in front of a a 10 year old or 11 year old, you know, and it's trending thigh gap, right? Like, it's like, it's, it's this, this is the piece that it'll trend into these hashtags where these kids will start following. And it's like, hashtag thigh gap or hashtag fit body or hashtag body positivity or whatever it is. And it's all about like, I want to look like something that to your point is not real and they will kill themselves to try to get there. Yeah. And then we have the other side of it. And this is something I was ranting about on the Adam Carolla show. I'll get to that. Let me, let me just do a quick ad here. I want to get to the other side of the problem because I think it actually plays into the side we're talking about now. Folks, um, Villa Capelli Olive Oil is the longest running sponsor of this show. Villa Capelli, I'll bet Dr. Stroman doesn't know this. In the United States, Lisa, um, we're able to cut olive oil up to 40% and still call it 100% pure olive oil. You can put virgin on it. You can do anything you want. 40% with seed oils and still say it's 100% olive oil because the truth of the matter is there's 100% olive oil, but it's cut, right? can't do that if you're Villa Capelli because they won't sell a lie. Villa Capelli, folks, real olive oil ain't cheap. Villa Capelli does the best job at keeping the price down. Here are three ways to keep the price down at Villa Capelli. Number one, get the three liter 10. Of course, when you buy in bulk, they can lower the price a bit. Number two, use the promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E for 10% off. Number three, if you spend over $100 at Villa Capelli, you'll get free shipping. So spend about 115 You get that promo code. That'll take some money off. And then you're still over 100 bucks. You get free shipping on a 3-liter 10. Come on! You can't beat that. Villa Capelli Olive Oil, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, 10% off every single time. I use them here. You're going to love them wherever you are. We're talking to the woman who wrote the book Unplugged and Digital Distress, two different books, Dr. Lisa Stroman. Lisa, there's another side of body positivity, and I'm confused by it. And I went into a whole rant about this a week ago on the Adam Carolla show. On one end, we have um, Lizzo. And Lizzo is a very talented young lady. I'll be the first to admit it. Lizzo is a beautiful young lady, but Lizzo is morbidly obese. And for her to say, I love being obese, I love my body, I lo-, fine, that's body positivity. But we're telling a whole generation that it's perfectly fine to be morbidly obese. There's the word morbid mixed right into the phrase morbidly obese. Um, what you're not seeing on Lizzo's body positive body is fatty liver disease, type two diabetes, a a host of other problems that will come along with that sleep apnea, just to name a few. Um, uh, You know, metabolic syndrome is a real thing. And then there's the other side of it, we have Adele, also a beautiful young lady, a great singer, Adele lost weight. But instead of saying, good job, Adele, People are hammering that woman. Oh, what you weren't happy being fat, but you got you got to be rich, talented, and thin. What's wrong with you, Adele? You you see, we used to we used to look at people that lost weight as a positive thing. Hell, before we learned that Jared was a child molester, we right. loved we loved Jared. Right? He held up that big giant pair of pants on on the the subway commercial and look. I used to fit into these. Look at me now. Eat Subway. By the way, folks, don't eat Subway. Um, But you see, we used to applaud Jared. But now we look at Adele as if she she's a pariah. We look at her in the same way as we looked at someone like Jeffrey Dahmer. Right. What's going on there? What, What am I missing? I mean, today, the the craziness of the cancel culture and trying to fit in and trying to grab a wave. Most of the time, here's a here's a interesting fact. There's 7.8 billion people in this world. 4.2 billion of them are online every day. If you're trying to be relevant in the 2.5 bits, 
contillion bits of data that are out there, you know, your cat video is not going to cut it. So you got to attach yourself to Lizzo or attach yourself to Adele or attach yourself to somebody that is trending and relevant in order to be part of that conversation. And so what you see is this massive like push towards how do I, how do I comment? How do I jump in? How do I get viral? How do I be that person who's jumping in? That's what our, that's what we're training our society to do. And so it is better to be in conflict with someone online algorithmically than it is to support someone online. You don't get, you don't get follows for that and you don't get any energy behind it. Uh, Chris, Leona, Megan, Debbie, and anyone else who works for my organization, uh, please uh, attach me to Adele and Lizzo stat. Do that. now. <laughs> when you hear this, do it. Okay. I, I just became a hero. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really scary that that goes on. Um, and well, Dwayne Wade, he just shut down his daughter's, you know, he's like, you know, listen, my, I've got a teenager. She's got an Instagram account. She doesn't need to hear all the noise. And he got attacked for being a dad for doing yeah. the right thing. I don't know Dwayne Wade personally. I, I work with a lot of athletes, but not him. Like I, him, like that is a hero move. Yeah. You know, we, why, why do we need the comments? I tell your friend, Dr. Drew, that all the time. I said, stop reading the comments. <laughs> oh, Drew, Drew has asked me, he goes, how, how do you do it? Because I get hammered off. The vegans hate me because I tell people to eat meat and eggs. That's a horrible thing, apparently. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't talk bad about vegans. I just say that the vegan doctors, the Michael Gregors of the world, the Walter Willits over at Harvard and... Uh, you know, McDougal and Clapper and all of those guys. I'm always, look, you know, these guys are lying to people and I won't stand for it. I don't hate vegans for being vegans. I feel sorry for them from being misled. Right. right. And so right. I get hammered. I get hammered a lot of line. And Drew always says to me, he goes, how do you deal with it? I said, Drew, one hand clapping. Said, Wait, what? <laughs> what? I said, try to clap with one hand. He goes, you can't. I said, right. No noise. Right. I'm not giving them the other hand. One hand clapping sounds like this. You hear anything? You give them the other hand. All of a sudden you can hear it. Drew is right. always giving them the other hand. I know. I, I, this man I have tried to help many times. No, he, he can't. I, I yell at him if he was here. <laughs> no, you, 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 you have to. Drew is such a kind human being, but he makes you yell at him. It, it, it's yeah. the sound of one hand clapping. Drew, don't give him the other hand. You know, just ignore but he can't ignore right and he said to me how did you learn to do this and i think i learned it in college because i played d1 football and people make comments about you and most of them are wrong mm -hmm. right as i as i used to say when i played football the average fan sits on a 40-yard line halfway up the stadium and they can't understand why one 18 year old guy cannot connect with another 18 year old guy 40 yards down the field while a bunch of 400 pound guys are chasing him. And then they walk out to the parking lot and they can't find their own car. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you know, how do you even listen to that noise of what people are saying about you? You have to cut it out. But Drew right. played D one ball. He never learned to cut it out. Right. He never learned yeah. that you have to just let it go. Right. He internalizes all of it. So, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, he might be your toughest patient. <laughs> very, very likely. Um, yeah. Well, it's just, it just, it's the society. It's, um, you know, whether it's D1, having a, you know, having trauma in your background and growing, you know, I was homeless at times. And, you know, my family, two of my family members, you know, basically overdosed. Like, and my father was the morbidly obese guy. And, I should be nowhere where I am, but for the fact that I had the ability to be centered by somebody who connected with me, first my teacher and then my grandmother. We don't have that today through our devices. We keep telling everybody this is social connection or social whatever. There's no connection, right? There's no connection if we're not having a conversation and if we're not looking at each other and listening to each other and respecting each other's journeys. and showing up for one another. You can't do that 
on these technological devices and expect our world to change. That's my opinion. So what, you know, we can sit here and, and talk about it all day, but I, we need some some resolve here. And I know you have to go in a few minutes, and I don't want to keep you forever. But let's get some resolve here. You know, I see kids all the time that can't look me in the eyes, right? Um, mm -hmm. We have these great neighbor, we have these neighbors, and none of the kids the, the 13 year old now first, he has a phone, but the phone is very restricted, right? You can only send text and whatever. Um, but the other three kids, no phone. They're playing in a cul-de-sac all the time. We have them come over for dinner. And so we try to introduce them to foods that they wouldn't eat, right? You, you know, uh, different cheeses. My wife is from Europe. So different mm -hmm. things that they wouldn't normally eat, right? We try to expose them to that stuff. But these kids can look you in the eye. And not many kids can do that. And um, we do know a lot of friends that have incels. Um, there's incels near and dear to my heart, right? And uh, I worry about these people. And they don't know how to act in social situations, right? They don't know how to sit across the table from someone and have a conversation. Um, I find at 60 years old, it is few and far between. My next door neighbor is a retired professor. Uh, he invites me over, we have a scotch. I invite him over, we have a scotch or coffee. And we have a real conversation. I think that's lost. There's another professor right. down the street. I have two professors on my lot on my block, and we all get together and we talk. I have a, a retired CIA guy, 76 years old. We get together, we talk. You know, we have a conversation. He sees me driving up, he comes out of his house, we talk. But these kids aren't doing that. What can we do to get these kids to talk and to interact and interface and and actually look people in the eye? What what do we do, Lisa? I mean, we have to start out as parents, grandparents, whatever role we have with these, with the young and, and really give them permission not to want the devices. Like I've, I've got a 14 and 15 year old, neither of them have social media. You know, I, I spent the morning building dirt ramps and teaching my son how to jump a dirt bike because I grew up <laughs> like out in the country. Um, and, you know, he had two friends over today and, you know, the fridge is filled with waters and trail mix and like, you know, like healthy you know, like that was my grandmother saying he was she was like this drawer, you can have all you want, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, you know, all of the stuff that you can have, teach them how to do those things again. I think that we're giving up on our kids, we're giving up because it's easy, you know, handing them a device and saying yes, is far easier than than taking the time to go out and build those examples for them or take the time to do the the pickups for the other kids to show up or going into your schools and saying, Hey, like how much time do you have where they're offline? You know, do, are you making that a requirement in the, in these ed educational institutions? And I think that we've for so long have accepted the fact that the tech industry is going to come in and gift in, you know, devices because it's good for academics. Our kids have no break. So we have to be better parents. We have to be better stewards. We have to start standing up and, and be able to recognize that it is okay to have quiet time in our brain and have conversations with other people. We, that, that's sim the simple answer. And it doesn't take a lot. It just takes you showing up and doing those things for, the, for these young kids. Okay, I need you to go back because you said something that, you know, I, I think is, you said it, and I think most parents are going to go, okay, that's not going to work, so I'm out. Okay. Okay. What'd I say? You said your kids don't have any social media. Explain what that means. Do they have so my, Give me so the my, of your kids if you don't so mind. So I have a I have a sophomore who's 15 and she has a device that she got on a random Thursday because academically she was fall, like falling behind, quite frankly, because in um ninth grade, they were requiring them to like download things and all of the stuff that she didn't have until she got home and she was trying to write down links. And, but again, it's a tool for her. So she has that device. My son is an eighth grader. Uh, he's 14. He just turned 14. Um, and again, plays basketball. My rule in my house is you play one sport and you play one musical instrument. Um, and that's required in my household. I don't care what it is, but you have to do that and you have to do it on a weekly basis. And that's what's required in my household and you don't get social media. And, and that's not to say that my daughter 
is a soccer player. She plays the piano. He plays the guitar. Like, it's not to say that they're amazing, like kids all the time, but I have standards. And as a parent, I have said, I love you more than I do the tech industry's propaganda and information that would be fueling into your heads. And I will not allow it. And I'm not going to let you have it. So I am that one parent that the other parents say, well, when, you know, Colton's parents let him have tech, you know, have social media, you can have it, right? I'm the example that they, that they have, they have to be able to like, say no to their kids. And I do say to parents, I'm like, all you need is one other family on your island, one other family that has the same rules that you do. And it is far easier. If you try to do it alone, it is much more difficult. But find one other family that can recognize that these devices are stealing their children away from them. The childhood of where we used to have mothers and fathers or grandparents or, you know, community churches and things like that were influencing our kids as a primary source are now TikTok videos. Like that's not healthy. That's not sending them good information. So find another family and, and don't as a parent say I'm out. (laughs) You have to show up and do the hard work. It is hard. Well, it, it, but you have to show easy. Up. I mean, to have a, a especially a girl because their whole world revolves around, you know, uh, am I pretty? At, when you're that mm-hmm. age, you, will a boy mm-hmm. or a girl want to be with me? You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's all about it, it, it. It gets. I think girls have a much more difficult time than guys in that way, and and when they're using the social media to do that, it, it's got to be difficult. Uh, your daughter got a device. What device is it? Is it a phone, a tablet? What, what did she get? A phone. Yeah. So we originally had a, a tablet and then that was, you know, she couldn't, she wasn't carrying it to school. And so, so now she has a phone that she takes to school. So it has text messaging. It has Life360, which she uses to track me more than I would ever track her. Um, and she, by the way, is not, she doesn't wear makeup. She's a beautiful girl. She's 5'10". She probably could model. Um but she's not sexualized because she's not on those apps. So the difference yeah. is, Vinny, that if you don't expose it to them early in life, like even though it, their their cohort is there, I can walk into any school starting in middle school and I can tell you which kids have social media and which kids don't because I can tell you by the way they're sexualized. Period. Well, you know, I, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never forget it. You know, my daughter stepdaughter went to the hoity-toity school out in, in Calabasas, Kardashianville. And uh, nice. all the kids in the class, or all their parents, these kids came to school in Ferraris. I'm not making this up. Not, right. not, not our kid. We, we were not the Ferrari family. <laughs> and um, it, one of the kids, I'll say, I'll say which kid it was, um, Heather Locklear's kid. <laughs> and, okay. Richie Sambora and Heather's kid. All the kids were having bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and the whole thing. And this little kid, by the way, great kid. They were great parents. They were at every school event. They showed up. They were one, even when they were broken up, they both showed up together. You know, united front for the kid. I'm pretty sure she's turned out okay in life. She's got to be 25 now, whatever. It's a little 25, 26, whatever. But they were all having bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. And this little girl looked around and went, wait a minute, there, there will be no party for me. So they had a party for her that was like that. We go to drop Tallulah off. And the girls, these are little girls we've been seeing around the school their, their entire life. They're 13, 14 year, year old girls now, 15. They got dresses where if they moved in any direction, you're looking at underwear. You know, it's like, they are dressed like like sluts. Right. And, and the little boys are like standing around. They don't know what to do with this. And <laughs> Serena and I show up and we're like, because by the way, the parents weren't allowed to stay at the party. We had to drop the kids off and leave. Right. Oh gosh. And I, I'm we're looking at this going, can you believe any of these parents signed off on these outfits? We couldn't even we couldn't imagine because we knew these kids when they when they were in the choir together or a band together or you know the play together and all of a sudden now they're all sexualized and they got the whore war paint on and the whole thing. We were shocked by it. And it's like, where do they learn that? Where, where did that come from? 
right? But that's yeah. what's happening. They're seeing it online. They're seeing it somewhere. Seeing it online. I mean, GTA, Grand Theft Auto uh, 5, you know, I just showed a clip of that in a speech I gave of like, a you know, the girl like is a hooker and he's talking about prostitutes and the married man who cares and who cares what this girl is. And she's dressed exactly like you're describing in a video. And it, it's like all of that, all of that information that's coming in through our kids digitally is all explaining to them that your value as a woman should be sexual and your value as a man should be to go out and reap the benefits of the fact that they're presenting themselves that way. That's a, a lot of what they're getting online besides like what gender you should be and all of the other stuff that is very confusing for these kids. These yeah, days. Look, I mean, you know, when we, we moved out of California, we moved to Virginia and a lot of these kids, there would be parties at our house because we were the one house that was now in Virginia near the university. And some of these girls are going to be doctors, lawyers, the whole thing. They come over for a party. It used to be cleavage. Now it's cleavage and side boob. So I'm like, what are we doing here? We're just basically covering a nipple, which, by the way, is slipping out of both sides of this now. Right. I, I sound like an old curmudgeon, but it's like, what are you doing? What What are you doing? Right. Like there's no mystery. There's no, you know, like I tried to explain some of the things that I have to say to these teenagers in here, like, please don't pull it out if they don't ask you to. Right. Like that is not a gift for a woman. Like if you're giving them a ride somewhere, because that happens all the time. And I tell women or my teenagers and, and young, young women, I'm like, you know, showing it and giving it away, the side boot Sunday, that's what like there's a hashtag. Side boob Sunday. Is there really? And I was like, yes, there is. <laughs> and so then how like it's, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, but, but they make it popular. And then of course now we're trending and now again, this is what we're following and we can post it. And again, I, I tell women, I'm like, why are you doing that in this world where it is, it, again, it's, it's, it's humanistically impossible for a man in, in that environment to not pay attention to that. Right. Like, I think that there were, we have to understand as women that men are wired. That's what they look yeah, at. And that, that, so if you didn't, I mean, had I not grown up with my dad and my brother, like I probably would be completely like unaware of any of that stuff. But with, with growing up and understanding, like you just have to understand as a woman, how to, to watch yourself and how to be careful and how to do it. And it means in real life and online. And that's the part that I think that, the distress and the the challenges and the the pain that happens is the girls are doing what they're kind of told to do and then they get vilified for it or they get attacked for it or they get like swiped right like i like you you're pretty but now i'm going to move on and so the, we're in this world of like casting people away that's what the swiping is left is is like and right is your trash right and so when you start to like look at people and judge people and cast them aside in those ways you know, where are we going to be as a society? I, I, I want you to explain the swipe and the whole thing, but you reminded me of something. I can't remember how old Tallulah was, but, and by the way, her dad's a great dad. Her dad yeah. is, she was raised by three parents, uh, me, uh, yeah. Serena, and her dad. And, but her dad is one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. And I'm not just saying that, you know, Mensa smart, but, Socially, he doesn't get it. Like he didn't know his daughter was having sex when she was having sex. You know, you know, we mm -hmm. we knew that in our household. But he was asking me, "You think she's ever kissed a boy?" I was like, "Oh, Scott, oh, we got to have a talk." You know, but I'll never, I'll never forget. It was around that time when she went to that party and a few of the bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs where the little girls were totally sexualized, and um, we were having dinner one night, and. Uh, the three of us, me, Serena, and, and Tallulah. And I said, Tallulah, you're not going to like what I have to say, but I have to say it. Your vagina is the most powerful thing on the planet. Not just yours, but every vagina. You see, you're, you're the custodian of one of those. And she looks at Serena and she goes, Mom. And she goes, Tallulah. Sorry listen to him. I said, Tallulah, religions have been started on one single, one single vagina. 
the Church mm -hmm. of, of England, the C of E. One vagina started that church. Wars, wars, millions of men have died over one, one vagina. I'm not kidding. And I, I wasn't saying it as a joke. I said, you need to realize what you have in your possession. And never forget it. Never forget that. That's the conversation you have to have with a girl one time. Because I didn't want her walking around thinking, Oh, he likes, oh, he's in love. It's like, no, when you're a kid, kid, other kids don't know what love is. Right. You, you want, as a boy, I grew up, I'm one of four boys. I know what boys want. I know what they will do. I know you will lie, beg, and steal when you're young to get it. Mm -hmm. Right. And she had one of them. And I did not want her to not know the power of it. Right. Right. Does that make me the worst parent in the world or the best parent in the world? I don't know. Right. She turned out okay. So something worked out. I'm not sure it was I that mean, conversation, but yeah, I think it's a great conversation to have with them to understand it. I think, you know, I learned in my 40s, like recently learned from a psychiatrist. He's like, well, you realize, Lisa, that uh, adolescent boys have between 10 to 15 erections every day. And I was like, I was not aware, I, you know, like as a woman, you have no idea. And he's like, that's just, that's just happenstance. He's like, you put a bunch of like scantily clad women in front of them. Like they've got no chance, like no chance. Right. So I, I think a lot of times like connecting like the power of sexuality with respect and having honor and integrity in that and what the relationships are. I, I say every speech I give to kids, <laughs> Social media and and the online relationships do not depict healthy relationships. Healthy relationships require respect. They require conversation. They re require acceptance and integrity with one another. Um, and they don't teach that. So that's what you were teaching, Tulula. Well, look, I, you know, I don't know if you, if your psychiatrist friend went on to tell you, for young males, these erections happen regardless of whether you're thinking about a woman or sex or not, they just happen. Right. You could be sitting there in the middle of class. As a matter of fact, every guy can tell you this story. You're sitting there and all of a sudden you, you have this raging boner and the teacher calls you up to the chalkboard. It, it happens. Everything is like, how did she know that? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm harder than the great depression right now. And, <laughs> and she's calling me up to the chalkboard. Right. It's like, right. What, what did she see it? Did she know? But it's be, and it wasn't because you had an erection. She, every guy in the class had the same erection. Right. It's like it, it's just right. what goes on, whether you're thinking about sex or not. And, you know, I, I remember. You know, that that thing that, you know, we used to say was like, well, you know, she got raped because she was asking for it. No, 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 no. I, she wasn't asking for it. And rape is not something that a guy with an erection does. Rape is something that a sick person does, right? It's power, right? It's it, power. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, the power of overtaking someone, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I get that. But in cases where you got some really horny dude who sees a girl scantily clad, he might not normally be a racist, a, a, racist, a rapist, whether he's a racist or not. <laughs> right. But if he's drunk or not thinking in his clear mind or taking any myriad of the drugs that are out there, I can see that being a problem. Whereas if he was in a normal situation, it might not be. What what, what say you? Well, I mean, I think that opportunists, right? I think that what we're doing is we're, we're creating a culture where sexuality and like being pro-sex is okay. And so I think that, again, like the porno pornography and like that exposure early on gives more permission. And so I think boys are tending to be a little bit more brazen. Shockingly, like my 14 year old son is continue like consistently, like, of course, I, you know, spot check his text messages, which he knows about. And these girls are like, you know, can you meet at the park? 
And he's like, well, no, like that's not, it's not how we roll as a family. So he's like, I can't do that. And they're like, I promise it, it'll, I'll make it worth your while. Like, who are these girls? Like, and one of them asked him to sneak out in the middle of the night. I was like, you know, calling my friend who's a police chief. I was like, shit, I got to get the cameras up. Like I didn't, I, I did not expect like these girls to be like, you know, starting to hunt down my son this early. And I, I know it's a matter of time, right? Like yeah. I know he will never rape someone. I know he won't because we've had a lot of conversations. I know because I have him read. Um, it doesn't have to be awkward. That book by um, Dr. Drew and his daughter, Paulina about consent. We talk about consent all the time. I know that he won't. Um, but I do know that he's an opportunist and he's a boy. (laughs) So, you know, you, you you gotta be able to talk about it. Yeah. You know, I, I agree. I mean, there was no social media when I was a kid, but boy, there were opportunities I used a window more than a door, you know, back in those days, you know, you know, in and out of windows, getting out of my house and getting into someone else's house. And we lived right. in a small community and I wasn't the only one that was going through windows. Right. We all did. It's what you did in the seventies. You well, know? And you said, and you said that you were on a dating app. So like it, when you think about it, that is, if you swipe right, you like someone and you swipe left, you don't no, want that, to talk no, no, to them. That, that right? exists. When I was on a, I was on something called match.com. Yep. And th- I mean, this, and by the way, um, I was signed up for three months and within like a couple of weeks, maybe a month, I called and, you know, uh, said, please end my thing. And they were like, we can freeze it. I was like, no, no, end it. And this is not working for me at all. Because I thought every single woman I went out with had lied about a myriad of things. Right? <laughs> the one, they didn't look the way the pictures looked. Um, I didn't realize that athletic means that you have 40 to 50 extra pounds on you. Um, I didn't realize that um, uh, when you said you were, you know, 40, you were actually 53, meaning you were 40 (laughs) at one point in your life, but now you're 53. Yeah, I was almost everything about these women were lies. And The strange part was every single thing about my thing was the exact truth. And more than several times, these women went, oh, my God, you actually look like your photos. And it's like, oh, what did you think I was going to look like? Not like that. You know, (laughs) I used to be pretty good looking. But, you know, I looked exactly because the photos were current. I had someone take the photo, my friend. Patty took the photos the, the, the when I had the kid, John. Everything was current about me. Everything was the truth. I, I just, it was like, wow, I was doing better meeting girls online at the bank. Be, I, because that's how you meet girls in LA. Wherever people, where do you meet women? Wherever you stop for long enough to go, oh, there's a woman and she's attractive. Right? So I never did the swiping. There was no swiping left and right with me. How does that even what, what? So, yeah, I mean, How does quick, it work? like you yeah, said really a slut you, or something if you swipe left and not a slut if you what, what, explain. <laughs> I don't even know. Well, it, you, yeah, I mean, it depends on the app. So Tinder is kind of known for hookups. Uh there's Hinge and Bumble that are like a little bit more for professionals. Bumble is like the girl has to like you before them. But the right and left is very pretty standard now whereby if you swipe you swipe the picture to the right that means put them in a kind of a cattle call that I want to start a conversation with them if I swipe left I don't want to talk to them because I'm not interested in what they, what they look like and I don't want to create conversations and so what you do is you kind of just very quickly are swiping I like I don't like I like I don't like I like I don't like and so you imagine on, as a young on. man B- yeah. based, based on one photo photo and like whatever the profile says about the person but right? it, right, so, let's say like if if i saw you very very pretty woman let's say i wanted to put you in the cattle which mm-hmm. way do i swipe right okay so i throw you in, in with the cattle right yes with how many other women can you have in that corral as many as you want so all right so if i'm swiping on you and i'm swiping on I don't know, 30 other girls like you, right? Mm-hmm. 
And then I've swiped this way because I just didn't like the look. How do you even keep track of the ones that are in the corral? Let's well, say I'd like you. I'd like to think there's not 30 other women like me. Oh, <laughs> oh, like, no, but kidding. you see that that's, <laughs> yeah, that's I know. thinking, but I right. put you in the corral based on your beautiful smile and your eyes, right? Okay. All right. So let's say I go in the corral and I go, oh, oh yeah, I remember this Lisa girl. Is your name even you yeah. put your names on these things? So your name is You only it? yeah, usually it's just your first name. You don't have a last name. Oh, I remember Lisa. I remember swiping. Now, can you? I can read about you, like I did on Match, right? I can read something. Is there something to read? Yeah. So you can read, and you can start using the app's chat function, and then you start the conversation on the chat function, and then pretty quickly people do. Um, they depart from that app and they start texting. They'll say like, "Hey, can we get out of this app?" and text, and then you then you share each other's phone numbers, which is like now another piece of data, right? But like you could run 30 women and if you can keep up with that many conversations and not get people confused, I, I can't, why not? I, I can't <laughs> call everyone pumpkin because I can't remember five names, including. <laughs> um, so, all right. So I see you, I talk to you. All right, Lisa, you, 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 you like, you like watching football or something. Oh, I love football. Who's your favorite? Oh, yeah. it's my favorite team too. Whatever the deal is, whatever you talk about. Right. You know, like to go hiking. Oh, I love to hike. You know, that kind of thing. But let's say I'm doing that with 10 other women. How do you decide? I had a dog once. Sophie, my favorite dog ever. Bonzo, I'm kidding. But Sophie <laughs> was my first Vishala. And I would throw a tennis ball yeah. in the pool. And Sophie would go and get the tennis ball in her mouth and swim it back in and hand it to me. So one day I threw two tennis balls in the pool. Sophie looked at the pool. She looked at me. She jumped in. She put the ball furthest away from her in her mouth and got the other one kind of caught in her chest and swam them both back to me. So oh, the dog is clever. <laughs> and I threw four balls in the pool. Sophie got the first one in her mouth, got the second one in her chest, went to the third one. Now she lost the second one. Now she lost the one in her mouth. And now she's doing, Sophie's all over the pool and she's not bringing me any balls. You see what I'm getting at here, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would be like Sophie. I would be in the pool with a bunch of tennis balls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> trying to that what happened? Well, it, it's, it's the hookup culture though. So like, if you imagine it, like the game is, it's almost like a, like a bottomless, drink or whatever you want to say it's like you can just keep going to the app and finding a new woman every day every week every whatever and so if you can convince her to meet you for a drink and you can convince her to go back to your apartment and hook up then you kind of like that quest is gone and that's really what what has been told like over these kind of like whatever it's like youtube or um, Instagram or whatever. It's like, you know, you want to find a pretty person or a good looking person or a smart person or, a, you know, a successful person and you can find them and you just have to swipe right and you'll get them and then you have a conversation and now we're negotiating. And that's what I see, right? Like I see, I see the sequela. I see the, the people coming in that are, that are swiped into or away from. And so if you get rejected all the time, then you're depressed. If you get accept it all the time that people just want to have sex with you. And then they never call you again, which is super popular. People like just ghost. They don't even have the decency to say, Hey, like I had a really nice time. You're a terrible lay or whatever it is, whatever the reason, like at least give feedback and then like move on. But like, nobody has the decency to tell but you. You have to look, look I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm thinking through this while you're talking. If yeah. I'm in that era of doing that, right. mm -hmm. let's say I swiped on you. Right. right. We did the phone call thing. We go out for a drink. You go back to my place. We have sex. It might be the best mm -hmm. sex in the world. But I'm thinking, mm -hmm. wait a minute. If Lisa did this with me on the first time, how many yep. of the guys has she been swiped right to and had a drink? She's she's an alcoholic slut because she's drinking every night and getting laid every night. That Wouldn't that be the thought pattern? It can be. I mean, there are a lot of people that, that do that. Right. And that's where I think like the app choice that you use matters. Like 
Tinder is kind of known like Tinder treats and like that it's really kind of just for hookups and the people that are on there kind of accept that, that they're not looking for a real relationship. But, you know, again, like, I guess you would, you would say that, you know, like you would say, like, if, if somebody's going to do that on the first date, like how, why am I special? Why are not they doing that with everyone? So, you know, I mean, I advise on that as much as I possibly can and try to teach people like you cannot build a sustained relationship on, you know, that passion or connection or chemistry alone. And that's really what those apps kind of force, right? It's just like the looks you know, we, right. you don't know, you can see somebody's eyes or their smile or whoever they are, but you don't know who that person until you have a conversation with them and you get to know them and see what kind of human they are. Right. That, but that's, what, we, that's what we, we need. See, to teach. Um, I've seen these shows where, um, uh, the, the, you know, maybe on Netflix or somewhere where, um, this guy was the, was that the Tinder, Tinder swindler? Or? Yeah. The Tinder swindler. Yep. Was that the guy that well, was, on yachts and airplanes yes. and, and using one girl to get to the next girl and just going through their credit cards. And I, I was yes. looking at that going, wouldn't getting a regular job just be easier and, and just being a good person. But no, this, this is what this guy did. Right. Right. And he got off on like living this, this like crazy life because he was, he could, and he was taking care of taking advantage of women that were giving him money. And he was living this like amazing life. Which, by the way, he's out doing it again because he got out. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there was a guy in L.A. I, I remember coming into the CNN um, tower and did a story on some guy in L.A. that was like setting up dates with women. And he would go to the, the, the you know, Nobu and all of these things. And then he would have to take a call and he would leave and he would leave them with the check. And so I came in and they're like, what's going on here? And I was like he's taking advantage of women that are desperate to find like a successful man. <laughs> That's wow. what it is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm saying wow, yeah. because I like no boo and I didn't realize you could do that. Um, <laughs> well, if you leave your date at the table, you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, honey, it was a phone call. You know, I, yeah. At that point, I would, I would finally have a cell phone with me in a restaurant. Um, right. Lisa, I, I can talk to you forever. Would you promise to come back on at some point? I would love to. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I, I kept it for way longer than I should have, but I, I'm infinitely fascinated with what's going on. And um, please feel free to come back anytime if you have anything to push or talk about or whatever. But um, I think this is the beginning of, of, of a, another conversation at least. Um, yep. I would love to, this is my, this is people and mental health and kind of how we operate and, and manage digital worlds. Like that's, that's everything that I do. So I'm happy to come on. Yeah. As you can tell, I could talk for hours on this. Oh, same here. I'm, I'm infinitely fascinated with the world that's passed me by. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I kind of kept up because I raised a kid, but man, this is beyond beyond. And, um, I could tell you stuff off the air, but I don't want to bring stuff. I don't want to talk about people on the air. Anyway, hang on. Yeah. I want to say goodbye to you off the air, folks. We got a few things going on. Let's see if if it's coming up on Halloween when this show comes out in a couple of weeks. We do have a special at NSNG Foods. And uh, you can get the ultra fat at NSNG Foods at a discount. Even if you have a subscription, go there and uh, put in promo code Vinny for 20% off. People are handing out my ultra fat now in um, Halloween bags. And, and that's what I'm giving out for Halloween this year. I'm giving out ultra fat. I'm not throwing candy at people. Last year, I just kept my light off and huddled down in my basement and no one knew I was home. But this year, I'm handing out ultra fat. And you guys can too. Promo code Vinny. We also have the super fan page at VinnyTotteries.com. And we have before you go to Amazon, go to VinnyTotteries.com to click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. You can go check out Lisa Stroman's book. Stroman is spelled S-T-R-O-H-M-A-N. She's got one book called Unplugged, and the other one's called uh, Digital Distress. She's also done a couple of TED Talks, so please go check that out. On behalf of Dr. Lisa Stroman, my name is Vinny Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.